<laughs> Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, the Reformation edition. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm Gavin Ashenden, and it's November the 1st, All Saints Day. Okay, you're going to need to excuse us up front. This is not our normal taping time. I had to go and work hard uh, this morning, this afternoon, and rush home to talk to Gavin. Gavin, so it's like 2.53 o'clock here. Gavin is on London time, or France time now. He, no, Paris, Paris time. <laughs> Paris time. and so Which, which is nearly bedtime. <laughs> which is always bedtime. So our normal jovial, wise comments may not come out as clear as they should, but just understand before we get started, we are funny, we are humorous, we are wise, and we should be listened to. Uh, also, if you get a chance, donate your likes. Just click like at the bottom of the YouTube uh, page there if you want you can subscribe to the channel so you get instant updates the minute we upload a new episode uh, if we're on Facebook share us with your friends don't be shy um, but I guess you have to admit we watch the program you could just say hey I found this I never watch it but you should watch it that's what you could do Gavin I notice you're no longer a pirate Yes, I've taken the patch off, Kevin. It, it produced some very exciting reactions, and on the whole, <laughs> it's probably yes. better to try and manage it without it. Um, so the the eye is getting better every day. It do, it doesn't like sunlight, so um, I can take the patch off, especially in the evenings, <laughs> when it's easier. And if people are wondering, Gavin's just a little bit more pixelated than normal. That's because the people in France just don't operate fast, nor does their internet. Uh, he's got good internet when he's at home in England, but well, when you're at the, the cottage in Normandy, uh, the internet is sometimes spotty, especially if it's been writing. But all our audience really cares about is do we have good audio? We do. Let's move on a little bit to the news. This is the week of the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, which everybody uh, in the news just says, well, it's Luther, okay. 500 years ago, he went to a door, he pounded a 95 thesis on it. But you and I know it's not just Luther. Uh, Martin, you know, certainly did his thing, but we have Calvin, we have uh, uh, the, the English people who uh, uh, worked hard in the Reformation. Uh, and so we kind of have the three streams, the Anglicanism, the Lutheranism, and the um, Calvinism uh, from the, the Reformation. Uh, that's something else, isn't it? Well, one of the great themes of the Reformation was semper reformanda, yeah, always right. reform, because we're human, we're fragile, the church goes through cycles. And so one of the questions we face today is what does it mean to find the spirit of reformation today for us? And you'll be pleased to know that the Archbishop of Canterbury held a service marking the 500 years in Westminster Abbey, to which he invited uh, Cardinal Vincent Nichols. And um, he preached an interesting sermon, which a few people, uh, Archbishop Cranmer has written the most interesting blog about it, because in the middle of it, uh, Archbishop Welby decided to refer, refer to Winnie the Pooh, to Eeyore and Tigger. And actually his sermon does kind of read like a theological discourse between Eeyore and Tigger. On the one hand, this is great. On the other hand, this is terrible. But meanwhile, <laughs> The, the interesting thing was at the end was at the end of the sermon he said reformation today is the pursuit of equality of, of political equality don't get involved in politics folks but reformation is about equality so I mean, those two things are of course obviously contradictory and I just wondered that I think the difficulty I have with with um, with the voice that comes out of Lambeth is is that what it offers is there's the soft spirit, the spirituality of soft, soft socialism, but it wraps it in evangelical language. So, you know, all the good buzzwords are there and you go, oh, I, I feel good about my faith and my love for the Lord. And then you say, well, what's it what's it directing us to? And the answer is the spirituality of soft socialism, which is not the gospel. Well, let's provide a little bit of history for our dear Archbishop, Justin. Um when I read through his sermon, he didn't complain that much about the First Reformation, which really was a desire to go to church, any church, and hear the gospel. 
you could go through all throughout Europe, Italy, um, other places in the world and walk into a Roman Catholic church and you were not presented with the gospel message. And that kind of really started to deteriorate. Uh, and more and more, the Pope got more authority and you guys know your history. Um, and that was man's reaction is I'm going to church for nothing. So 500 years later, people are going to church for nothing again, and they're having the same type of reaction. They don't want justice for all. They want to hear the gospel. Well, so if, I, that's the interesting thing, Kevin. Yes. You're, you're, you're right. And, and, and 500 years ago, the gospel wasn't available for technological reasons as well as ecclesiological correct, reasons. Yeah. Today, the gospel is available, and Justin Welby celebrated the gospel being in the hands of people. The problem we have today is that we have archbishops who don't believe the gospel, who won't live the gospel, who won't accept the values of the gospel, but would prefer instead the values of secularism. Mm -hmm. So once again, it's the same issue. Do you allow the scriptures to speak authoritatively to the church, which conforms itself to them? And, and for the church to be reformed, the answer is it must do it. Our great complaint in the Church of England is, we have the gospel in our hands, but our leaders won't implement it. They don't believe they don't believe the values of the New Testament take priority over everything else. So Justin thinks the New Reformation is about affirmation. Uh, I see a problem there, uh, and obviously some other people see problem. Uh, and I I knew this was going to happen before uh, October thirty first came. I said somebody somebody somewhere is going to walk up to a church door and pound something into it. I didn't know. I thought it would happen here in America because we're into that drama thing, and I, you know, maybe France it would happen. Uh, certainly, Germany is going to happen. It actually happened in the Church of England. It's very exciting, Kevin. It's not nails; it's blue tack, which it's isn't quite tack. as dramatic. <laughs> but, but on the other hand, the doors of Southwark Cathedral are made of glass. Nails wouldn't work. Blue no. tack's great. Yes, it so, is. So, um, what? <laughs> So what we had last night was uh, that the doors of St Paul's Cathedral in London and Southwark Cathedral on the South Bank of London, somebody unknown, some, some agent, uh, put up what's called the Southwark Declaration, which 60 Orthodox clergy signed some time ago, but essentially calling on the bishops to believe in the gospel, to implement it and to teach from it and to warn them that if they didn't, there would be consequences in terms of canonical obedience. So this declaration has been pulled out, dusted off and just at the right time and the right moment fixed to two of the London cathedrals. I, I understand from some some um, rumours that I heard, there's a possibility it might be affixed to the doors of every cathedral uh, during the next uh, during Advent. So uh, at the moment, there's a little a little game on to see which which cathedral will have it affixed tonight. Well, but here, essentially, here, it's well. Let's do a challenge. If you're going to do it, please videotape yourself, send it to us. We'll be glad to play it during the show where, you don't use a hammer, just use the tack. Uh, that if you want to, we will broadcast your hammering, uh, tacking of a declaration onto a cathedral here. Excellent. Well, then, then you, can't, you can't offer more publicity than that. No. <laughs> so, of course, the, the, the problem is that it's most unlikely that our bishops will repent because they've been chosen. From to, 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 to present a certain kind of theological profile that's acceptable to the present regime. But who knows? Um, the Holy Spirit can do anything. We should pray that, um, that, that some of our bishops who long to be faithful to the authority of the scriptures and are reminded of the need to do so uh, on Reformation, uh, the anniversary, that, that they might. Um, let's, let's pray and let's see. Now, what happens if they don't? That, uh, have you heard of the Countess of, of Huntington? I have because I did some research on the Free Church of England and she helped fund and start the Free Church of England. That's the only thing I know about her. Kevin, you know as much as I do. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm, I'm, in, I'm embarrassed that I knew so little about her. Yeah. So uh, I've been reading up about her and, and I'm blown away with what I've read. Excuse my, my chiming No, talk. that's all right. <laughs> now people know it is 3 p.m. on the Eastern Coast and what, about 8 or 9 over there? 7 p.m. 7. Yeah, yeah, okay. uh, 7 p.m., yes. Well, the, the Countess of Huntington um, was an Anglican, 
and she believed in Anglicanism and the 39 Articles and, and the Bible. But what she had difficulty with was the Church of England when it was constrained and out of shape from, from its allegiance as a state church. She built out of her own funds 64 churches uh, in order to allow uh, Wesley and Whitfield uh, a platform for their movement of the renewal of the Church of England, which is what it was intended to be. And one of the places she built a church was in Tunbridge Wells. It was one of the first ones she built. It was called Emmanuel. It was knocked down in 1974 to make access to a hospital. Um, but and the and the, the opening preacher was Whitfield himself. Oh. Now sometimes his, history history sometimes follows similar patterns. So this come this week, Emmanuel Free Church of England has opened again. Uh, not as a, a, a wonderful building paid for by an immensely rich and pious benefactress, but as a church plant in a house in a in a in a, uh, a rather modest housing area run by a Church of England vicar, one of the vicars of Tunbridge Wells, a guy called the Reverend Doctor Peter Sandlin. Now, Peter's quite a sharp cookie. He holds a, a PhD in St Augustine from Cambridge. Uh, he runs a, a a large and growing church in Tunbridge Wells, and he's one of the people who looks to his his bishops and the Church of England and says, up with this unfaithfulness, I will not put. Mm -hmm. uh, now, one of the things that you can do in England at the moment is you can hold a Free Church of England license at the same time as holding a Church of England license. So he has a license of the Bishop of Rochester, but he has a license to Paul Hunt, who is the, the Bishop of the Southern Diocese of the Free Church of England. And on Sunday night, they open this new plant full of people and uh, he's going to run both together. Uh, now, you'll have to ask him what his strategy is in the future. Oh, I know. I'm take... sure he got up and said, <laughs> I'm going to tell you about justice for all and equity. That's what he taught, he preached on, right? No. <laughs> I don't think so. No. And uh, so uh, these, these, these two churches with, with, uh, will be run side by side. Now, it's just possible that a number of, you know, we've talked about the Free Church of England recently, partly because in terms of Orthodox Anglicanism, it's the other show in town. It's not very large, but on the other hand, when it was started up uh, at the same time as Wesley and Whitfield had the doors of the Church of England closed in their faces, it was the answer to the to beginning of a new renewal, renewal mood. Now, if there are any very rich women out there who want to build 64 churches for, <laughs> for church planters and evangelists, I'm sure there'll be people queuing up. But, but, uh, but other than that, let, let's keep our eye on, on Emmanuel Tunbridge Wells and, and see what the Lord, the Holy Spirit does. So, But the last time there was a church plant there, it was for renewal. Hmm. It was for renewal. And, and, and it was Whitfield who uh, who stood yeah. up and preached the first sermon well let's let's hope we can repeat history because a lot of people are forgetting <laughs> yes. history uh, all right so let's move on to i'm hearing news from uh bishop uh hereford the bishop of hereford uh that they're out of money he has a problem uh he uh, he held as you know this diocesan synod uh, where the, the rules of the Synod weren't fairly applied. Everyone on his side got lots of time and everyone on the Orthodox side got half the, the amount of time he and his friends had. And um, uh, but, but so he won the debate and uh, they've now sent this petition to General Synod asking for a liturgical blessing for same-sex relationships. But he has a problem and that is his diocese is going bankrupt. He doesn't have any money. So on Monday evening, he's gathering together all the clergy. Uh, the, the clergy that he... Um, uh, that that he embarrassed and uh, uh, and and I think probably I can't say humiliated, but I mean the, the clergy he put through this particular diocesan synod, and he's going to come to them and say, "I want more money." Well, um, the project in the Church of England can only happen on the backs of faithful Christians giving. Mm -hmm. It's the faithful Christians who keep the Church of England solvent. At some point, one hopes that their leaders will say. We are not going to provide the money for a heterodox, soft, socialist spirituality. You do it with your own money, not with ours. But we'll have to wait and see what happens at this meeting with the Bishop of Hereford and his leading clergy on Monday night. Um, if, I'm, if I hear any news, you'll be the first to know. Well, I f I'm finding it very much ironic. It was not but 500 years ago a bishop was traveling around Germany collecting money, handing out uh, 
uh, uh, ways to heaven. It, it was it, it was it was Tetzel, and <laughs> Tetzel had this lovely little ditty that every time a coffer, every time a penny in the coffer yep. rings, a soul free from purgatory springs. That was that was his <laughs> sale act. Upon which, uh, with which they built, where well, they built St. Peter's, I'm glad. I mean, it was, right. a, it yeah. was effective. Uh -huh. But on the other hand, people said, this is not the gospel. No, the, it, everybody knew, especially Martin, uh, thank God. Uh, so we'll have to see if he can't uh, repeat uh, history himself by uh, offering people a way to heaven with a penny. Uh, I do want to thank you for your time, and I'm glad you were able to stay up late. Um, I, I know Mrs. Asher didn't want you to bring your little warm glass of milk so you can sit back. Um, now, what's the prognosis again with your eye? You, you finish up with a patch, and a you, you couple more weeks, you'll be good? or? Um, I think I'm getting old, Kevin. This uh, recovering from uh, from operations is taking longer than I remember it used to. Uh, it's kind of two steps forward and one backward. The um, there are days when I lose my balance a bit and mm -hmm. uh, and I experience a certain amount of face ache, and there are other days when I wake up and I say, "Oh, I'm well. I'm normal. This is fantastic." And except it doesn't last as long as I want it to. But I think that's everyone's experience of convalescence. No, it, yes. I... So uh, I'm just so grateful that um, I'm beginning to be able to see out of this eye. I appear to have my sight back thanks to an amazing uh, amazing surgeon. And as long as I don't do anything silly, then then hopefully it just gets better and better. I have trouble writing at the moment because the screen causes the eye pain with the light coming from it. But there are good days and bad days. Thank you again so much for, for all your prayers. And can I do a big shout out to my friend Bob, yeah, when please. I arrived, when I arrived in Normandy and discovered my router had appeared to have completely blown up, and I was isolated from you and from the whole internet, I called my friend Bob and said, "Bob, help! Not you too," he said. And yes. like you, he uh, he came out and he uh, he bless him, he sorted me out. So Bob, thank you, guys. You owe you owe Bob for this one. We do. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Bob. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm Gavin Ashton, and this has been episode 339 of Anglican Unscripted.